Hi, this is Carl Erb, uh, yoga instructor at uh, yoganexus.com, and I'm here doing an interview with Richard Geldard, a uh, professor of philosophy and Greek scholar and scholar on Emerson, and uh, in 2010 did a book, Emerson and the Dream of America, Finding Our Way to a New and Exceptional Age. And uh, Richard, while you have written other books on Emerson uh, about his writings and his context and his time, this book is of a different nature. It's, it's not a book so much about Emerson and his time and how he navigated uh, uh, other theological developments in his period, but really more discussing uh, philosophy as it is pertinent to our personal life and, and our national fabric in America today. So what motivated you to take this angle on his teachings at this particular time? Yeah, that's that's a good question. and. And good morning, Carl, and while we're at it. And I began with Emerson with a book called uh, The uh, Spiritual Teachings of Emerson, which was a book about his uh, focus on working with self-recovery, the individual. And uh, <clears throat> then came a book called God in Concord, which was Emerson's own uh, spiritual awakening. Uh, he was, as many people know, uh, a Unitarian minister. And he resigned from the ministry and began his own personal uh, spiritual search. Um, and then with this book, which came about, it started in 2008 when uh, Barack Obama was elected president, and I felt that there was an opportunity in America uh, for there to be a, a convergence of, of a new impulse in American politics, which he represented, and some of Emerson's teaching. And so this book began with individual self-recovery, which was his basic theme in self-reliance, and it cannot take place in a country and a culture that prevents a person from attaining at least a minimum of physical security. And here we are in a country, a very wealthy country, with one in every six people living in poverty. And our politics over the course, as everyone knows, in the last three or four years has evolved into a horrific sense of, uh, of polemic conflict. So I felt that somehow Emerson might address that issue in some useful way. Wonderful, and and it really did strike me as pertinent. And I had read God and Concord uh, before that, and so that was a good context for sure. And I think it is interesting that in this so-called modern age, largely apparently secular society, when you say a, a polemic, the polemic does center strongly around uh, spirituality and religion in this country. And you address that uh, as well in the book. Uh, yes, I do. Um... And, of course, I don't, don't imagine, I can't imagine a more strident uh, polemic uh, conflict that we are having at the moment, especially in, the, in, in religion. I mean, then we, then we have the Mormon influence suddenly on the scene, which had been pretty much in the background for a long time, um, even though there have been other Mormon politicians entering the field. Nobody thinks of of Harry Reid, for example, as a, as a Mormon, because it doesn't involve uh, his work in the Senate. But suddenly, uh, it's in the forefront. But in Emerson's time as well, during times of quote-unquote great awakenings, um, the, uh, the fundamentalist impulse in American Christianity has uh, been very much at the forefront. And Emerson had to deal with that all the time. And so the issue is uh, uh, very pregnant for, uh, for our time. And you uh, mentioned in the title, And the Dream of America, 
Can you briefly uh, mention what does that embody for you in this context? Well, I'll start with Emerson, and Emerson said that America is another word for opportunity, quote-unquote. And by that he meant um, an opportunity for everyone. And, of course, he was, an, he was an abolitionist and was one of the great calls against ending slavery. And basically he argues in many places for there to be a level playing field in America in which everyone has a, an equal opportunity. And of course we see in today's uh, society in which we have the Occupy movement uh, arguing stridently against the 1% for keeping all of its money to itself um, and not permitting a level playing field to exist. And that also means racially as well as economically. So in order to develop freely uh, who we are and what we can become, it has to be an equal opportunity for everyone. The aim isn't to make America economically great, in fact, but to be a country which allows its people to develop fully, individually, to become fully fully uh, who, who we are uh, as individuals and as a people. Right, so in the context of the Obama election and then the groundswell that uh, followed that and then the reaction that came with the Tea Party and then hence more recently you mentioned the Occupy movement. Uh, these are uh, this new and, and, and uh, changing or exceptional age that you reference in the book and, and you see his teachings of, of self-growth and opportunity as, as something that uh, be wise for people to pay attention to in these times. Well, that's exactly right. And, and um, we, now, we know, of course, that there is a, an extraordinary movement which really began in the 60s in this country and <clears throat> with uh, people beginning to explore their inner lives. Um, and so the work that you're doing, the website that you have up and so on, and uh, even the, the work of the university where I'm teaching now that teaches the wisdom tradition, um, there's a great deal of interest in it. But, it. but it's still a very small movement. And let me quote Emerson for a moment here. He wrote an essay in his uh, second book of essays called New England Reformers. And here is something that he said there. We, as in Emerson and his circle, we do not believe that any education, any system of philosophy, any influence of genius will ever give depth of insight to a superficial mind. Having settled ourselves into this infidelity, our skill is expended to procure alleviations, diversions, opiates. We adorn the victim with a manual skill and his tongue with language, his body with inoffensive and comely manners. So we have cunningly hid the tragedy of limitation and inner death that we cannot avert. Is it strange that society should be devoured by a secret melancholy which breaks through all its smiles and all its gaiety and games? Unquote. That's an extraordinary statement uh, about the condition of, of the country. Um, as Emerson said elsewhere, America has an extraordinary reputation for superficiality. Yeah. So how can we break through that into depth when the culture um, adorns its victims with, with alleviations and diversions and opiates? And to your point, many of the, <clears throat> the practices, uh, for instance, I, in the yoga instruction, even a lot of that takes the form uh, of adapting to that 
urge uh, and becomes uh, woven with these entertainment and distractions and overstimulation, whereas traditionally the practice is one of solitude, reflection, and silence, and study. Uh, you know, teachers that I work with have said that the student matures in silence and, and peace, and not in seeking distraction, diversion, and overstimulation. And um, you mentioned that also in the book, that that, that need for that inner life uh, in this time is important, and how to cultivate that. It seems like linking that to our understanding of education is powerful. And uh, this is also something that's been in the national dialogue recently with funding for student loans and these kinds of things. And there's statistics of how much California spends on prisons over education is, is quite amazing. And so it sounds like you're seeing uh, uh, this message and, and education is really wed together. Education not as uh, purely mechanical and for economic growth, but really training us as people to, to find our own inner talents, our, our path, our duties, our, our contribution, that taste that we have to offer as individuals. Exactly. And one of the interesting points that you made about more people in prisons than the university is that Emerson said at one point, I have spirits in prison whom no one visits if I do not. And what he meant, of course, with that was not physical prisons, but spiritual prisons being uh, so confined by uh, a superficial world that they cannot even begin uh, to seek some sort of fundamental and effective inner life. Um, so, as he said, we have cunningly hid the tragedy of limitation and inner death. Yeah. And, and um, how do we break through that? So, the purpose of this particular book was to open that up and begin to say to the, to the culture, uh, to the broader community, that um, uh, there is this opportunity, but y there is this tremendous need to develop the discipline uh, to, uh, to be able to find uh, moments of, of silence and reflection. And, you know, Emerson began each day with his uh, cup of coffee and a slice of apple pie to go into his study and then engage in a period, probably an hour or so, of, of conscious reflection before he actually did anything. And from that, there arose um, his work for the day. Um, and he then said that what he did was to take dictation that was based on that, that uh, obedience to inner reflection. That's beautiful. I also heard, remember, it brings to mind a quote that Martin Luther King offered one time when somebody said, how do you, you accomplish so much in any given day with such pressures? How does that happen? He says, I give my first hour of the day to God. God gives me the rest. <laughs> well, yes. And, of course, in Emerson's world, um, the the God, as it were, was what he referred to as the oversoul or universal mind. And he didn't uh, conceive of the same God, I think, that King talked about. But he talked about the sense of one mind, a universal mind, universal consciousness that that would arise in moments of solitude and uh, inspire him. Certainly, and that's been my attraction as well, the comparison with the yogic teachings and the Vedantic teachings, the understanding of, of being itself or consciousness. And Emerson talks a lot about the human mind itself being a, a, a path to understand that universal consciousness of which we all manifest. That's so right. he sees each individual's uh, that personal contemplation as a doorway to a broader inclusion of all groups across all societies, and that, that is very different than a lot of the fundamentalism that we see now. Yes, and um, 
And of course, one of his major points is is uh, that life has to be lived on a higher plane. We have to get to a what he referred to as a higher platform, and we are constantly invited to to make that effort to to get on the ladder and begin to climb. So when that happens, when we do reach that higher platform, everything changes. Um, and uh, our skepticism falls away, um, differences of opinion fall away, and we begin to find a, a quieter ground of being, a truth yeah. that can begin to respond to. And this is a practice that I offer to in meditations where it, it's a, a sense of loving kindness and inclusion across all groups, so losing sight of our perceived differences. Um, you mentioned the, the obedience and, and that, that shift of uh, what, what that contemplat contemplative time uh, does to a person, and it brought mm -hmm. to mind also not only Emerson's notion of obedience as a, as a window to that, but hand in hand is that cultivation of values and, and virtues, and what strikes me is that it's, it's not presented as values and virtues are not external authoritarian impositions, uh, but rather an opportunity to uncover our, our essential nature, come closer to that, that essence of being. So, um, well, anything more you can say about that connection between obedience and values as that connects to this uh, trends we're seeing today? Yes, when I, when I talk uh, in lecture, for example, or in front of a group of people, and we have question and answer and so on. When the word obedience comes up, you can see in the faces of people this immediate resistance. Um, and it's always funny because suddenly um, the, the, the sense of, of an authority uh, opens up and people uh, go on the defensive. And yet when you begin to talk about obedience to an inner impulse, to something inside ourselves, uh, people then relax and say, oh, okay, I can be obedient to that. But the fact is that it's equally difficult. <laughs> uh, if, uh, because this authority that comes from an inner desire, or an inner uh, decision or intention, there has to be an intention to... Uh, move to a higher plane, to begin to climb. And so, uh, since the path is difficult and uh, narrow, uh, people find that they begin and then they, uh, they lose the sense of, of intention and determination. It's easy to slip away, but the fact is the work is hard. And we have to be obedient to... Um, this, this impulse, uh, and it's so easy to fall away. Um, well, he also said, <clears throat> I'm looking at your book, and there is a quote of his that, if no law can be sacred to me but that of my nature, then you go on to say the test is to determine what that nature consists in. So that reflection has to precede that obedience and getting in touch with a, a nature that is indeed uh, inclusive and compassionate, and, and that's where I, I see the link to an understanding of virtues, which you also address not as external but as internal motivators to yeah. uncover um, more our essence. It reminds me also of the story somebody told me of Reuben Carter, the hurricane story, the boxer, right? And uh, how he one time looked at himself in prison, couldn't recognize himself with all the anger in his face, and, mm -hmm. and realized that's not who he was. And, and yeah. it was then getting closer to his more essential nature through forgiveness and compassion and so on. Well, that's a, ver that's a real moment. That's what that is. Yeah. Uh, to be able to do that, to have that insight. I mean, that's what Emerson would call a revelation. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time. And sure. uh, do you want to share a little bit about the upcoming class you're offering, uh, where that is and, and, and what that's about? Uh, sure. I... 
in fact, I don't think it's too late for someone to uh, uh, to tune in to that. Um, the um, it's called the the University of Philosophical Research, and it's located in uh, downtown Los Angeles, and it teaches the great wisdom traditions. It, there's a wonderful faculty, um, and I'm very privileged to be a part of it. And um, I offer two courses there: one in early Greek thought. Um, from the early earliest Greek thinkers up through Plato, and then this course in Emerson and the uh, and idealism. So uh, this particular course begins actually on Monday, and people can begin a a master's program, master's degree program there, if they're interested in further education, or they can also audit a course. I believe the if I'm not mistaken, auditing this particular course, which goes for 10 weeks and contains 10 audio lectures, which I prepare for the course, along with a lot of wonderful discussion um, among students. I think an audit course costs about $300, and um, which is in these, these days a bargain. And um, the last course I taught... I had a student from Singapore, I had a student from uh, Australia, and um, about four or five from California, and then around the rest of the country. So it's a, I learned so much from, from these uh, wonderful people that uh, uh, come online, and uh, we have uh, uh, wonderful conversations and so on. So it's, uh, I think, the future of of education in this country and taking advantage of all the wonders of of uh, the internet and and this the kind of communication that you and I are having right now. Yes indeed I really appreciate that. That's true. It's a good opportunity with the technology we have to to broaden our horizons as opposed to succumb to the overstimulation and and diversion. Any last thoughts for um People navigating their own private melancholy and getting closer to a ground of being today or participating in society in a different way? Well, all I would say is that, that Ralph Waldo Emerson is one of the great founding thinkers of this culture. And he is a, an extraordinarily great teacher. And sometimes people think his essays are difficult, but if if one is willing to spend time with him, and you can go online, uh, rwe.org, for example, is a wonderful site for all of Emerson's work, including his journals. And uh, uh, Emerson has never been out of print since 1850. <laughs> since 1850. And, uh, and uh, he deserves to be... Um, read and studied, and it's a wonderful way to begin. Well, I must say, Richard, you are a wonderful guide through his works, and I think for a lot of us who might see his more popular published works, your books, uh, God and Concord, and also the Emerson and the Dream of America, really uh, take us deeper into his journals, and, and a lot of uh, writings that many of us really uh, couldn't see, maybe now they're available online, but prior to that, you know, they're really not available in bookstores, and... Uh, You'd have to be at the university libraries and so forth to find a lot of those. So it's been a great uh, journey in your books. And I think uh, to the complexity that he might have in the language that might be hard for people, your books are a great way to, uh, to bring that into our modern and contemporary context in a very personal way. So thank you so much for your works. Well, it's been my pleasure and it's been um, a very uh, lovely discussion we've had this morning. Thanks. Thank you. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.